One of these films was the first adaptation of Richard Connell's incredibly famous short story from 1924, The Most Dangerous Game, A Tale of the Hunter, and The Hunted. The other was a mid-40s remake of this interpretation, produced by the very same studio, which mixed up the second act drama and updated the story to the Second World War. But which is the best? The short story from which these films are based has benefited from a plethora of adaptations over the years across all popular mediums. On the big screen, these iterations usually employed a new spin on the classic, such as changing the setting to outer space and the victims to bikini-clad blondes, which clearly excited Jean-Claude Van Damme and turned him into a right hard target. For the sake of my sanity, and your patience, I diluted this battle to the two adaptations by RKO in 1932 and 1945, which retained the original story's characters, locations, and tone. We open with a nice little yacht travelling through exotic seas. It transports a variety of luxury guests, including our hero, Bob Rainsford, a celebrity hunter and author. In a wild case of convenient foreshadowing, they converse over the nature of the hunter and the hunted, and the notion of becoming the latter leaves young confident Bobby a little shaky. On the other side of the boat, the captain has a bad feeling about this, rightly so, as the misplaced boys lead the yacht into shallow waters, and ultimately, the total destruction of a poor model boat. Rainsford survives the carnage, and a frenzied shark attack that follows. Less than ten minutes in, and we're already off the boat and onto the island. Oof, thank god this isn't a Peter Jackson remake. Rainsford quickly stumbles upon a dodgy looking fortress in the jungle. He is greeted by Ivan, a typically 1930s horror henchman. When I say greeted, I mean he just violently stares the poor sod down. The real host of the house emerges and introduces himself as Count Zaroff, a Russian Cossack and fellow big game hunter, who warmly welcomes Bob as a guest and introduces him to the survivors of yet another shipwreck, Eve, and her drunk brother, Martin. After a good 20 minutes of ratcheting tension via careful conversation and sneaking suspicions, we get right to the action. We learn Zaroff has become bored of his hunting passion, but the only cure to rekindle his fire was to hunt man, hence this spooky island retreat. Martin is disposed of, and Bob and Eve are launched into a tense game of cat and mouse in the jungle. If they can survive until sunrise, they will earn their freedom. The most dangerous game is what Reddit would call a true gem, a thrilling blend of 1930s horror, with dilapidated fortresses, hulking silent foreigners, and trophy rooms full of decapitated heads, <laughs> and action adventure, shipwrecks, animal attacks, and jungle traps. It is only an hour long, which was perfectly acceptable at the time, but it gives the movie a breakneck pace. The excitement of the opening boat scenes grab your attention instantly, and the dramatic build-up in Zaloff's house and the lengthy chase sequences that follow are equally balanced. It feels very much akin to another RKO picture of this period, but also seamlessly blended horror and adventure. I refer, of course, to King Kong. That's no accident. The most dangerous game was filmed on the very same sets as Kong, shot during the night, once the other crew had wrapped. The pair also share a number of cast members, including most notably and beautifully, the actress Faye Ray. In fact, Miss Ray's character Eve was unexpectedly one of the film's highlights for me. She was a surprisingly proactive cog for the plot, and not just another trophy for our competing hunters. It is her intuition and investigations that warn Rainsford about Zaroff's darker side, giving our hero the necessary kick up the backside. Later, she becomes a bit of a damsel for Rainsford to protect, but for a fair chunk of runtime, in terms of the good guys, Eve is actually the most in control. Rainsford is foolishly charmed by Zaloff, while Martin is slinging back vodka shots like James Bond on a bender. Speaking of Mr. Bond, as a big fan of the series, I got a lot of familiar joy from the scenes in Zaloff's fortress. It is quite impossible not to compare the Russian villain's long confessional monologues 
whilst acting as a very shady host. He even looks like a bloody Bond villain. A Blofeld style facial scar, a beard like Drax, an outfit suitable for any self-respecting Spectre agent, not to mention his own private island where he hunts worthy challengers for sport like a certain Scalamanga. Oh, that would have been too easy. In his own right, Zaroff provides a lot of entertainment. His motivations and reasonings are fucked up, yes, but are made perfectly understandable to the audience. He is also a real Count of Camp. Don't worry, the Count will take care of me, all right. Indeed I shall. His line deliveries are comically accented and often exaggerated, frequently slipping out of his phony image of respect and class to openly mock his guests. I've lugged the gun around a little. I've lugged the gun around a little. What do you mean, sane? Cigarette? Hmm? Yeah, thanks. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> a chat between the hero and the villain also seems to imply poor Zaroff has trouble maintaining his own hard target unless he has returned from a satisfying hunt. Rainsford agrees that sex comes after the hunt and not before, but there's no doubting his erectile prowess, no sir. He is as straight-laced a hero as they come, and the script doesn't give the actor any difficult beats at all, but he is a likeable, charismatic guy. When the jungle japes kick off, Zaloff does feel very formidable, and so you really root for Rainsford as the clean underdog. He's given the most bare bones of a character arc, but hey, it's better than nothing. As I mentioned before, a passenger on the boat goads Rainsford and tries to shame him for his hunting, trying to put him in the furry shoes of his animal prey. Now, deep into the cat and mouse game, Bob does admit to Eve that he now knows what the animals felt like. In a more modern picture, this would be a long quiet scene, where the characters and audience catch their breath, perhaps hiding in some cave, where Rainsford could waffle on about his changed character. Those animals I can't. Now I know how they felt. One quick line bellied in the middle of an action scene, and on they go. Oh hey, it gets the point across. The jungle drama is well directed on both the action and suspense fronts. The chase through the swamp is snappily edited, and the shots where the camera itself chases our heroes puts the audience in the moment in a way I was not expecting. And then, the rise and fall of each of Rainsford's makeshift desperate traps are displayed to full tense effect. We watch intently as Rainsford concocts his plan, sets it up, and then nervously sees how Zaroff will thwart or succumb to it. All in all, it is a very basic tale that is executed to about the highest degree one could hope for in 1932. So then, how would a remake fare 13 years later in 1945? There were two aspects to the remake, which was retitled during production to a game of death that sparked my anticipation. Firstly, the film was directed by Robert Wise, the Oscar-winning director of West Side Story, The Sound of Music, The Haunting, The Day the Earth Stood Still, and much, much more. This version updated the villains from Russians to Germans, on account of the film being made in 1945, of course. I thought this could add some exciting new flavours to the story, which while originally impressive, still had room for an extra dash of salt here and there. Well, I was very much disappointed. The shift from dodgy Russians to dodgy Germans is little more than a cosmetic change. Zaroff is now called Erik Krieger, and at one point shouts Auf Wiedersehen, but that's all you're gonna get I'm afraid. It's nothing more than a sign of the times, and in regards to Robert Wise and the rest of the film, <laughs> I was surprised to find it rather lazy, and frankly, redundant. <laughs> The first 30 minutes of the film are practically identical to the original, but delivered in a shoddier package. The first film's boat scenes may have been over in less than 10 minutes, but there, it all played out very naturally. In a game of death, it feels like the film is in a terrible rush to get to the island as soon as humanly possible. We are suddenly shoved into a small set full of people we don't know, including our hero. The original film had a nice progression of events, 
that stacked up to reveal the protagonist. The captain has suspicions. The discussion with the passengers, leading to name dropping the hero, then hearing their voice, before finally meeting him, subconsciously setting up this character's importance. Robert Wise just makes Rainsford one of the gang. No fanfare, no nothing. But it doesn't stop there. In fact, it barely stops at all. Everyone, especially Rainsford, talks at speeds at over 80 knots, and before you know it, boom! The ship begins to sink, and we realise one of the film's major faults. Almost all of the exciting moments in the film, the ship exploding, the sharks, all of the material involving the bloodthirsty hounds, is lifted straight from the original footage. I know, that might not be a huge problem if watching this movie independently, but viewing it so shortly after the original makes for a very tedious experience indeed. The scene in which the hounds are released for a chase through the swamp does suffer regardless. Ivan is not in the remake per se, but he suddenly is in that one scene, thanks to the reused footage. Eric Krieger also suddenly grows a beard like Zoroff just for that one scene as well. How thoughtful of him to pay tribute. Some new footage was filmed for the scene, but it either is a direct replication of the work that came before, or is just some clunky shit, <laughs> like this pirate going down like he's in a glitching video game. The new footage clashes against the old, and for a scene that requires such fast, tight editing, it crumbles under the weight of the task. On the whole, this problem is emblematic of the entire remake, at least when it acts as a carbon copy. The boat scenes in the original featured a gentle sway to the footage. Yes, it's a minute detail, I know, but it goes a long way in making the scene visually interesting, whilst increasing production value. The remake's boat scenes are dead stiff, and just feel like any other studio set. And Rainsford just isn't as friendly here either. The man has all the charisma of a slop bucket. And he is even denied that one line of character evolution that the original gave him, so he stays a one-note bore throughout. Lines of dialogue are borrowed from the first film, but are given extra additions that ultimately chip away at the tension. In the original, Zaroff warns Rainsford not to enter Fog Hollow Swamp as a gentlemanly favour. It showcased that respectable trait in the villain. Here, Krieger warns Rainsford not to enter Fog Hollow because he will be forced to use the dogs in there. Not only does that strip away that side of the character, but it ruins the sudden shock escalation of events when the villain unleashes the hounds on the heroes. Come on, who wants to be a negative Nancy Vo? Is there some good to be found here? Why yes. Krieger instantly recognises Rainsford from his hunting books and starts to fanboy over him. This is a definite improvement over the original, where the celebrity revelation is withheld until they join with Eve and feels a bit off. The threat of the dogs is given a better build-up in another way. It is used as a deterrence inside the house before their inclusion in the later hunt. Instead of Ivan, we have Pleshki. Unlike the silent Karloff-style beast, Pleshke has a rather large speaking role, and is more thoroughly involved throughout. Ivan had a classic presence, and some mystique about him, but he was underused and was bumped off unceremoniously before the grand finale. Pleshke, to his credit, makes it to the very end too, to try and help the final climax have more weight. Speaking of climax, is it just me? Or do I detect a hint of homoeroticism between Krieger and Plushke? Gone completely is Zaroff's spiel about conquering women after the hunt, and Krieger is not as interested in the female guest as Zaroff was. That could be because that was a pre-code film and this is very much post-code, but still. I've been to many doctors, but only Plushke can give me a relief. Only Plushke can give me a relief. Relief. Krieger boldly claims that all the doctors in the world cannot heal his aches and pains. Only Pleshka can give him relief. Followed by a redressing scene. Oh, what's happening here? I was dumb enough to reach over and relieve, relieve him. Really though, there is one important change the remake made that must be addressed, and may well be the reason why some would prefer this adaptation. Initially, I was intrigued that the drunk brother wasn't being played so comedically or so exaggeratedly. Turns out, that is part of a large twist. The brother here is just acting up his low alcohol tolerance to fool Krieger. And when the trio sneak into the trophy room, 
They're not caught by the villain and forced into the jungle game this time. Instead, they devise a set of plans to outsmart Krieger and turn the tables in their favour. Ellen, as she's now called, and her brother must distract the evil parties, while Rainsford must pretend to befriend the head honcho while also creeping out into the jungle to lay some traps ahead of time. Some may prefer this plot progression. Certainly it makes Rainsford more of a proactive figure and adds an element of a mental cat and mouse game on top of the physical one. However, the plot inevitably journeys to the same destination, with Rainsford and Ellen running for their lives against Krieger in the jungle. With this more intricate series of events, it takes a lot longer to get to the action, and honestly neuters the high stakes. The old Rainsford was facing up against an incredibly stacked deck, and was forced to make traps on the fly, desperate, improvising against the odds. I care less about this fucking Rainsford, he's so damn cocksure all the time. The traps being preset, far less interesting, as the pacing was, you know, all messed around. On another note, the distraction games do give Eve a little more to play with, but the assuredness of both Rainsford and her brother as well, unfortunately detract some of her original significance. Anywho, it is time to play the real most dangerous game, sharing your opinions on the internet. Best Ghost 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 While Pleshka is a stronger character than Ivan, and Audrey Long is pretty decent as the new lady, I much prefer the original freeway combo portraying Rainsford, Eve, and Zaroff. Best, 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 best. Spoilers for a 90 year old film incoming! There aren't many kills across either film to choose from, but it obviously has to go to Zaroff's demise in the most dangerous game. After a serviceable scuffle, Zaroff takes a fatal hit, but like all good villains, He's not dispatched so easily. He lines up a shot to take out the escaping couple, but falters and slowly descends into the hungry mouths of his pet hounds below. It is a well-crafted shot, and the perfect stab of irony to conclude the film. The remake's version is embarrassingly weak in comparison. The initial wound occurs off screen, and his final fall is too quick and clumsy. Without a doubt, the original's door knocker is the champion here. Look at it. That's a set of knockers I'd love to get my hands on. Alright, Van Dam, calm down, calm down. Best film, best film, best film, best film. The most dangerous game is the most entertaining movie. Well, that's enough of my droning voice. What about yours? Which version do you prefer? What other adaptations of the short story do you hold in high regard, if any? Thank you for watching. Auf Wiedersehen!